You can see it's 746. It's actually the 3rd of March, 2012. Um, I was going to make a short video about my ideas on the future. <clears throat> I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but when you look at Hubbard peak theory, peak oil theory, when oil runs out, his prediction on Texas crude production was spot on. In the 70s, we hit, or the US hit peak oil production and dropped off almost straight down because the curve is not a bell curve, it's like a logistic distribution where after peak production we drop off very steeply and the two biggest oil reserves basins in the Middle East and Kuwait and Saudi are in decline and as you know the whole world is dependent on hydrocarbons in 2006 the world produced 106 million tons of ethylene ethylene is the most common organic product that is the precursor to the three other major uh, organic compounds that lead to solvents, PVCs, ABS plastics, everything. And every kilocalorie of food that we consume requires 10 kilocalories of hydrocarbon energy to get on our plate. For example, in 1970, John Bourgon, Borgou? No, Bourgon, he won the 1970 Peace Prize, and his work for genetically modified crops, he developed efficient strains of wheat and introduced modern agricultural techniques into Mexico, Pakistan and India and within two years those three countries became net exporters of wheat. So you can see how the whole world depends on these cheap carbohydrates that are based on cheap energy because to get a barrel of oil out of the ground, I think, in, in Kuwait, it takes like a dollar US. And now imagine that the world needs 15 terawatts of energy per day, and we can't anticipate when this energy uh, crisis is going to happen based on when peak oil production actually is. And in terms of financial markets with the trend, and the slowdown of the trend, and the momentum of the trend, if you put an RSI, which means relative strength index on the rate of production and let's imagine that rate of production is being consistently positive and not uh, it gets a bit complex then but if the assumption holds that countries are constantly making making crude to keep up with demand if we see a drop in momentum of crude production and there's a bearish RSI divergence more than 20%, that more than likely means we're into a divert, into a, into a decline. And what it all boils down to, and these are not just my ideas, it just comes from stuff I've been watching and reading and picking at. Ultimately, if we can't find or speculate when that crisis is going to hit and fill that gap, if we can't meet that energy need, then there's going to be hundreds of millions or billions of people that are going to die of starvation, even in Canada, the US, and, and say England, because in my fridge recently I bought some stuff from Tesco's, be it cucumbers or from Kent, some baby plum tomatoes or from Senegal, that's 2400 miles away, and where did my lettuce come from? It was Spain. Shit, just think about the carbon footprint of those vegetables. It's shocking. And as the world goes, as globalization expands and China becomes a super economy and there are, what, 2 billion people all want to drive a car and they consume more crude and they want to eat more beef and a kilogram of beef takes 13,000 liters of water to produce, but yet... Uh, the same quantity of soybean takes 3,000 liters of water, but we feed 95% of soybean stock to cattle. And we're going to chop down more rainforest to raise more cattle for more McDonald's and, and Burger Kings and all that shit. The world needs to change their diet and start investing in, in green energy. For example, 
In England, I believe consumers spend more on ringtones than the government spends on fusion research to capture the potential energy of a star with, with you know, n igniting deuterium at the center apex of some laser beams to get more energy out of it than we put into it. For example, Donald Trump recently, the plum that he is, and it just shows how ignorant he is of this potential energy crisis. There's gonna, they're going to put like 13 or 11 mega wind turbines. They might make 10, not kilowatts, but terawatts of energy. He doesn't like the fact that it might spoil the view for his 750 million pound golf course. So he's going to spend 10 million pounds in an advertising campaign against wind farms. What an absolute dickhead. He should just take that money and chip it into the project and say, here, make five extra units and uh, wire some of that energy into my complex so that we can be more green. What a moron. I'm, of any respect, that was very small I had for him. And just think about his carbon footprint on the whole world. It's diabolical. I've lost it. So unless the world starts to embrace green technology and get off petroleum and these asshole lobbyists that are in the pockets of the oil companies that influence moronic politicians that don't see the future picture and they cannot be forward thinking enough to know that, that we can't live now based on hydrocarbons. Just imagine, right? As the energy crisis kicks off and we can't get all those barrels of oils into the super tankers to get them to the US to run those combine harvesters to make all those wheats and we can't feed people and there's there's famine and hunger and society falls apart and global economy the global economy denatures there's no way that governments can fund and build the solar panel array that we need to fuel the planet to fuel the planet for example i believe 300,000 square kilometers of PV units or solar panel arrays based on the most efficient technology that's available right now, which might be nano solar, and they have a, a 40 nanometer carbon, maybe a carbon jack, and the photon hits it, it transfers it to the piezoelectric membrane, and they're very efficient, maybe, maybe double the normal efficiency. I think they capture 40% of the sun's energy, but plants capture like 99.9% because they use quantum mechanics. When the photon hits the chlorophyll molecule, that photon is transferred to the energy center and uh, basically uh, the plant is able to, tra to transform carbohydrates into sugars very efficiently because that photon knows the most efficient route through that maze of protein bonds. It's quantum computation. And what we're talking about is ribicose, rubicose, rubisco. It's the most popular protein on the planet. It's so important. And thank goodness that quantum mechanics uh, like transfers those photons to, to that enzyme, to that reaction center so efficiently. But basically what I'm saying is that if the world cannot manufacture this array in time, and create energy to drive these combine harvesters that might then have electric engines, the whole planet is absolutely fucked. So to sum up, your kids born in the last three years that might live for the next 80 years, they are going to see the effects of a global energy crisis if the energy gap is not filled Assuming that Hubbard's curve happens in the next 20 years and peak oil occurs then and oil production drops off and there's no more cheap energy for the planet and that affects global the global economy, it causes civil unrest and wars and the combine harvesters cannot run to create these cheap carbohydrates that the world depends on, and of course three quarters of the world work in agriculture and three quarters of them work and till the soil by hand 
and they might not be be affected because they can live off the land. But I'm talking about the, the, the cities where most of the world's populations live. It's, it's, I'm starting to see a possible reality in terms of a populistic outcome of, of a definitive resource that can no longer be provided. It's that simple. Actually very scary.